Welcome again. So I would venture to say you probably feel just a little bit different now than when you came in. Maybe a little lighter on your... Yeah, that was perfect! On cue! I'll give you the money later for poking the baby. Um, <laughs> but maybe a little lighter on your feet. Maybe a little more hopeful. See, the more you enter in, the more you get transformed. So if you're, if you're new to us, please don't tune out because you think we're talking about money. Money is just the tip of what we're talking about. We're talking about a lifestyle of worship. We're talking about why do you look at some people and go, why does God do all that for them? And I sit here and struggle. Because somewhere along the way they figured out there are streams in the kingdom of God that you want to get into. There are patterns in the kingdom that you want to be a part of. There are ways that God set things up that if you will enter in with him, he will provide more than you can ask or imagine. Now, will he break into your life and intercede in the midst of tragedy and heartache and difficulty? Absolutely. But if you get tired of your life being a fire alarm, right? Everything's, everything's drama, everything's boom, it blows up every time. You're probably, you've accepted Christ, but you haven't come to an understanding of how do I walk in the things of God? How do I continue to maneuver myself into the streams where God does what he does? See, because you can be saved and you can be absolutely going to heaven and still lead a very destructive life. Because God loves you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're saved. If you confess to him that you're a sinner and he's your Lord and Savior and you continue to confess that, you are saved. You are absolutely, I put that to rest right now, you are absolutely going to heaven. You are absolutely a child of the living God and he loves you. But if you're living a fire drill, do you know what I mean when I say that? Everything's broken everything's you find yourself in the midst of tragedy all the time there's always some drama there's always something and you always you go you go someplace and everything blows up um literally not literally but uh, figuratively or you're like you you just go why do i keep finding myself in this circumstance why do i keep going out with these destructive people you haven't figured yet how God has patterns that he sets up and has established since he created time, since he created us, that move us in to his path and his blessing. Does it mean that I won't have struggles? No, it doesn't mean I won't have struggles. Does it mean it won't be difficult? No, it doesn't mean it won't be difficult. It means quite possibly that I come and worship God on Sunday morning, but that's the only time I do. I listen to the preaching on Sunday morning, but that's the only time I'm in the word of God. I love the worship music, but that's the only time I focus on Jesus. And what God's doing is he's saying, I love you more than that. Will you come with me? Will you come on a journey with me? The first word I ever spoke in my prayer language, and I realize some of you are like, prayer language, what's that? Well, we'll get to that. I can only teach on so many things at once. But, but um, Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I don't have love, I'm just like a gong banging. Boom, boom, boom. I always think of the gong show, that big thing they put up there. But, but he said, well, so what tongue do angels speak? And when you say, well, prayer language, what's that? Well, what do they speak in heaven? What do you think they speak English? Just because that's, that's what all the movies do in, in the United States anyway. In another country, he probably speaks... In, no, God has a way to communicate directly with us, and he gives us each a prayer language that is exclusively ours to pray and communicate for our spirit to communicate. The first word I ever received in my prayer language was the Chaldean, the Chaldean word for journey. 
I wouldn't even find out what it meant till I came to Nashville and was taking a class on exegesis. Exit, did I say that right? Yeah, the study of biblical words. I know it's not exit Jesus, okay? It's exit Jesus. But I was studying the word and I was studying the original language and I looked up this word. And it's called halakha. And you can find it. And it meant journey. It was it was it was like when a caravan goes cross country. So I got to Nashville and I'm studying this and I'm all Wow, Lord, I'm so glad I made the right decision because you just connected my connected me from where I used to live to here with that one word you gave me. Now, can you, can you give me more than one word? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you might say, well, this, man, this never happened to me. <laughs> Don't feel sad. It's okay. Give yourself a pat. It'll be all right. Jesus wants to. But he has to get us off. He has to get us off me FM. Onto his FM. He has to get us off our channel. Get us on his channel. He has to get us tuned in. So we're hearing. Instead of the what's in it for me channel. We start hearing what's God up to channel. Okay. Right? Because radio signals travel. Just because you don't get the signal doesn't mean it's not out there. It just means you're tuned into the wrong station. He's trying to tune you into a new station. So when we talk about stuff like this, it's not just about your money. But money's kind of important, right? Here's the reality. I wasn't born in a third world country. I was born in the United States. The Bible says we're each born for such a time as this. Okay, so I was born here. So to live and minister here, I have to have a certain level of availability. And because I chose to get married, I believe that was God's calling. I have to have a certain responsibility to provide for my wife and my family. Those are all things I have required of me. And so to conduct the ministry God has for me, there's a certain a certain way I have to go about things responsively to be available. Could I be an effective street preacher if I didn't have a home and I was living in the woods and I would go to people living on the street and pray for them? And could I do that? Sure. That's not the ministry God called me to me. That doesn't mean the person called to that ministry is any less important than I am. But what we're doing is we're saying, God, to whatever extent you want me to, I will accept your blessing. And to do that, I'm going to learn how you do things. I'm going to learn how you walk things out. So one of the ways we do that is our money. Because our money is important. Don't think it's important? Don't, you don't get anything without it, right? So, God really gets our attention with our finances. Or our lack of finances. I used to love doing budgeting when I first got saved because I was trying to do a budget. And it was really easy. Here's my bills. Here's my debt. It was more like this. Here's my, here, no, wait a minute. Here's my income. Here's my debt. Here's my income. Here's my debt. So, the world would say, okay, you got to start, you got to start, uh, you got to use this um, snowball effect. You got to start applying money to the smallest accounts that you can affect and get that snowballing so that once you pay off that, then you take that money and, 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 and the rest of that and apply it to the next one and the next one. So I'm like trying to do this and, and I'm, I'm a new believer. I mean, I'm a new believer and I'm trying to do what's right. And the, and the, the, the pastor did this teaching on, on tithing and, and talking about how to give. And, and, and I wasn't actually at that one because I had to work. But my wife went up and talked to him afterwards and said, hey, we're, you know, we're trying to do this right. But my husband wanted to, wanted to confess that we weren't, we haven't handled things the way we're supposed to. And he looked at her and he said, that's awesome. Tell your husband and you that you just confessed for both of you and your household is going to get in line in the name of Jesus and you guys are going to be fine. So I stopped worrying so much about snowballing the debt to start tithing. 
and then take what I could and pay. What ended up happening is we became a debt-free household in two years. What should have taken 10 took two, okay? I, I, I'm not a genius. It wasn't some huge mathematical formula. I just decided that it nervously I was going to write the tithe check first and then pay the bills. All right, here, next slide. So the difficulty with that whole process is, see, money is a tangible item. You can see where you spent it. <laughs> Maybe you can see where you spent it. I mean, I guess you get all cash and just, but so sometimes it can be difficult to break patterns. You can be frustrated because you're just stuck. But if you will take the same thing Je Jesus did for you for your salvation, if you'll take the same thing and say, I'm going to apply this to the rest of my life, Jesus is going to meet me right where I am and he's going to walk me through how to go from here. To say, and I know, I know at this stage, some of you go, I don't have anything to give. So this really, but if you get these principles now, if you get this understanding, as God begins to resource you again, and you've got these things in place, you can put these things in place so your life doesn't have to be a fire drill. You don't have to be constantly going, you're going, you know what? My budget says I don't have money for that. I'm not going there. And then you find out that whole thing was a whole blowout anyway. You didn't need to be there. Because it wasn't where you needed to be. And God just spoke to you through your budget. He said, no, you don't have finances for that. Don't do it. And as you get those concepts, as you put those into place... God moves you and moves you and moves you and then pretty soon there might be a time in your life where he says I want you to do this and you're like Lord that is huge I, I don't have the resources yeah but I do and I want you to be a part of this and I want you to see how I move in this and I want you to be a part of this with me and I'm going to ask you to move out into this way beyond what you expect, way beyond what you imagine and, and I'm going to provide the resources because now I know what you're willing to do. I'm going to move more, more through you. I'm going to move more finances through you. I'm going to move more blessing through you. I'm going to move more ministry through you. I'm going to move more of my spirit through you. Why? Because you're willing to say, you know what? It's not, this isn't what it looks like and it doesn't work the way I think it should, but I'm going to follow what God says. And, and he does that everywhere and our finances are no different. We treat our finances differently because we've kind of been trained to. I mean, re reality, I grew up in a house where, um, you know, we, we went to church on Easter, maybe. Uh, maybe. Or on Christmas, maybe, if my grandmother took us. And, and my folks would say things like, I know we're bad people, we don't go to church. But they're hardworking people, they love God. They started going to church when I got saved. Amen. I didn't say I did that. God did that. And, 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 and now they're patriarchs. Now you can see all the people they've blessed along the way. So, next slide. Jesus explains how the kingdom works. So we're going to start with this. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Um, Anybody comfortable reading out loud? Maybe, hey, Mr. Hobbs, you got a Bible with you? Can you bring it up here for me real quick? And then, yeah. Okay, I want you to read it, read it, read it for us. You don't have to read it off there. Uh, okay, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Give me a hint. Um, you're doing good. Okay. Well, somebody got another one? I already did merciful, didn't I? For they shall... Okay. For they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Is that my, am I still on it? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, is that it? Okay. Cool. cool. You, got, you got the gist. Mic off. You trying to tell me something? <laughs> You're trying to tell me something. Oh, I had a song come into my head. I won't sing it, though. Um, okay, so Matthew 5. So, and 1. All right. So, so Jesus, we call this the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Or the Beatitudes. Jesus didn't get up and say, okay, guys, I'm going to teach the Sermon on the Mount now. Okay? He was traveling, and it was time... And so he starts his ministry with this amazing discussion about the kingdom of God. And what's he doing? He doesn't say anything about himself. He doesn't say anything about his mission. He basically says, I want to help you understand something. The kingdom of God doesn't work how you've been trained. Okay? The, the, the leaders have not been teaching you how the kingdom of God actually works. So here's how it works. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So, wait a minute. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Wait. So Jesus' whole thing, i got to change my translation here because it's not the one I wanted. I want... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to have all this stuff done before I get up here. My apologies. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Poor in spirit! Anybody feel broken? Anybody feel like they want to give up sometimes? Anyone feel like life is too much? Turn to the person next to you and say, welcome to being poor in spirit. What do you get being poor in spirit? For yours is the what? Kingdom of God. Do you think there's someone who doesn't want you to know that? Right. So the next time you feel that, you say, wait a minute. Scripture says... That means the kingdom of God is mine. What's it mean to be part of a kingdom? What's it mean? You're part of a kingdom. You're protected by the authorities of the kingdom, right? You're under, you're united, you're, let's look at it this way. You're a United States citizen, you're traveling abroad and something happens, so you go to the U.S. Embassy to be protected because you're a United States citizen. You are, the kingdom is yours. You're protected by the kingdom. You're provisioned by the kingdom. You're promoted by the kingdom when you're poor in spirit. Doesn't work that way in our, in our, in our culture, does it? Okay? So, blessed are those who mourn because they're going to be what? Comforted. They'll be comforted. God doesn't say, get out of your mourning. Stop it. He says, no, I'm going to comfort you. Okay? Blessed are the meek, for they're going to get trampled on. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Meek is humble. Meek would be, if you look at it this way, if I'm six foot and you put somebody five foot next to me, compared to me, they'd be meek. Meek is, is in, you might even consider insignificant or unconsequential. In the workplace, the meek get forgotten. In the marketplace, they don't get acknowledged. So basically, God says, if you are small and insignificant you 
you're going to inherit what? The earth. So, so what's God saying? What's Jesus saying this whole time? He's saying that it works exactly the opposite of what you've been told. If you are disenfranchised, if you are broken, if you are humbled, if you are minimalized, you've got access to the kingdom and all it's full of and everything it has. If you're marginalized, you have access to the kingdom. So God says the disadvantaged are fully advantaged by the kingdom of God. We don't have to stay there. That's how he draws us in. This is the beginning of his ministry, okay? So Jesus is saying, you, you who've been told you can't have it, you won't get it, you don't get it, you're the ones I came for. You're the ones I'm after. And with you, we're going to transform the world. Think about how he chose his disciples. What? What? Zealots, which would have been very aggressive political type people, tax collectors, dock workers, <coughs> fishermen, dock workers, right? You ever been around a dock? I used to go with my uncle when I was young to um, in the Bay Area, and he would run, he had a truck route that he ran, a, a truck, and we would go to all these docks where the Teamsters were, and to the, the, they weren't just the ocean docks, but other players shipping, and I mean, you talk about some rough folk, he'd be like, I need you to just stay in the back of the truck, okay? Don't go off onto the dock, just stay in the back of the truck, we'll get this done, and we'll get out of here. So, Jesus chose dock workers, Right? He chose people who were rough and rugged and smart and intuitive, but weren't using their gifts for the kingdom. Amen? So, why do we bring this up when we're talking about giving? Because the kingdom doesn't work the way we think it does, and we need to apply that same logic to our finances that we apply to our life, to our ministry. Next slide. And Jesus tells us about true treasure. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So... Why is Jesus talking about our money? Because he knows if that's what we put our value in, if that's what we think, why doesn't God let, now I know I, this might get, con I don't want to be too controversial, it's not my intent, but why doesn't God let every believer win the lottery? I mean, if he really wants to bless his people, wouldn't that be easier? Couldn't I just win the lottery? Why? Because there's no lesson that comes with that. There's no training that comes with that. And God, and I'm not, if someone wins and they want to give to the church, that's fine. That's, that's you, between you and God, I got no issue with that. <laughs> but, but as an example, why? Because you don't see people, you know, Christian people, some do, and you want to, whatever. I'm not getting into that. My point is, God wants us to learn as we grow. He's more interested in our eternal life than just our moment of satisfaction right now. Because he plans to be with us forever. So he's training us for reigning right now. In heaven, you won't need a lottery. So we don't need one now. And I'm not getting into a big controversial issue over that. I'm just making a statement that God is big and he's bigger than any resource. And if he started us on a path, he's going to finish that. He's going to provide. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, I want to show you a little bit about how I do Bible study, and, and, and you can do it this, some people do it this way, some people don't, but just to give you an idea, I'm breaking this down, this scripture down. 624, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will lo be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, so somebody keep that passage open for me, Matthew 624, so that you can help me refer, because I'm going to move to the next slide. Let me, let me do that. I'll put it over here, too. Matthew... Chapter 6, verse 24. I talk to myself when I do this stuff. Okay, so, next slide. So, went to the Strong's Concordance. That's not a weightlifting thing. It's not a... Uh, uh, oh, oh. Strong's Concordance is, is how we... <laughs> Sorry. It's how we find out what the original words were used before they translated the Bible into other languages, okay? So, in Strong's, I just get this picture of Strong. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. So, master. So, no one can serve two masters. Master is, and they give you their kurios. Kurios. Okay. Supreme in authority. Controller by implementation. Controller. No one can serve two controllers. Wait, mammon can be a controller? It says you can't serve two masters. Okay? All right. What's mammon? An Aramic origin, wealth personified, avarice. Avarice, greed. What's mammon? Gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it. We recognize mammon, don't we? Because mammon shows up in our addiction. Gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it. Gotta get it. Right? It's, it's 1230 at night and you're knocking on doors because you ran out an hour ago. Remember? Ouch, huh? But see, God was there. He's not jabbing you in the side, going shame on you. He's going, no, I protected you. That's why you're here. You're alive today because I protected you. And I want you to be here. All right, so we've got master, controller, mammon, avarice, or wealth. Got to have it. Okay? So no one can serve two masters. All right, so let's, next slide. Okay, we've, okay so far? Okay, so hate, because either you will hate the one and love the other. So hate, to, dis, 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 to detest by expression, to love less. Wow, hate one and love the other. Detest Jesus Christ? To detest God? Serving mammon is detesting God? Do you see how if you get stuck in a pattern and you don't let God get you back on track, if you don't let him help you get into the stream of life that you belong in, do you see how even being saved, you can continue to stumble over the same things over and over again? Because he keeps bringing up to you saying, will you deal with this with me? Will you deal with this with me? Will you help me? Let, you, let me in to deal with this. Love is a more in a moral sense so no one can serve two controllers for either he will have a total distaste for one and totally be morally and socially acceptable of the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other all right let's take a look next slide loyal Adhere to, care for, and despise.
to think against or disesteem. Okay, so think about this. No one can serve two controllers or two masters for either he will hate and despise and not want to be a part of one and totally love the other and respect the other or else he will be loyal to, he will adhere to, he will listen to, he will care for the one and he will no longer esteem or think properly of the other. Do you see what happens? Does that make sense? As we break down the scripture where it says, God, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. He's trying to call something out in us and says, if you feel this in you, this is what to do. You got So what happens when we tithe is we're breaking that wall. We're breaking that barrier that says, I'm going to trust in my money to get things done. We're saying, I'm going to trust God to get things done. So I'm going to start with the tithe. I'm going to start with the tenth. And we'll get more into the mechanics. I'm not really dealing with the mechanics with it as much right now. I'm dealing with the concepts and the ideas because these are not just financial concepts. Mammon exists in many shapes and forms. Next slide. So mammon instruction leads to anxiety and puts the great value on things. God's counsel leads to peace and places ultimate value on you. So when you get that, you get that, I got to have it out of there. God's like, no, I, I, what I got to have, I got to have you. That's what I want. Amen? Doing okay so far? Okay, almost done. So I, I sum it up today with this one scripture, because talk, we talk about this scripture all the time, but it really does apply here. Next slide. One more slide. That's it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, here's, here's the thing. God's not saying, don't take away from this just an idiot. I'm never going to get this stuff. Oh. Don't have what I call the Eeyore mentality. Oh, is me. Not going to get it. Never understand. Everybody else gets blessed. Uh, you know what I mean? You know? You know, you've been around those people. He's just like, oh, no, no, get away. It's not that. It's as I'm doing this, I'm relearning these things. They, they tend to get pushed aside. You get saved. You get excited about what God's doing. You start walking with God. You start doing stuff and learning, and you, you implement what you learn. And then somewhere along the way, you realize, wait, I used to do that. I stopped. Wait, I used to do that that way. I stopped. Or you're like, wow, I've never done that before. I want to start doing that. <laughs> That sounds cool. I've never had it explained that way before. I always thought people just wanted my money. Well, they probably do. But we're way more interested in your heart than your money. What we're trying to do is say, if you'll serve God, he'll take care of our needs and your needs. He'll provide for us and you. And we'll all get to be a part of this great testimony of what God's doing in this little place in Lewisburg. Amen? So it's not a shame on you. Your ways are not God's ways. He's not up there going, you're just never going to get it. You're never going to get it. I told, I, I said to the son, I said, son, they ain't going to get it. I, the Holy Spirit and I got together and the son, the father, son, the Holy, we all got together and talked about it. They ain't going to get it. Look, Adam and Eve messed it up from the start and they just keep messing it up. That's, that's not what's going on. He's, he's up there. He's just cheerleading. He's like, oh, son. He's like, Dad, look. Look at what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, son, I see it. Look. Hey, Holy Spirit, look at that one. Watch that. Yeah, isn't that great? Look at this. Look at this. I mean, the, the, you, the biggest cheerleader you could ever have is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
he is totally stoked about you and what God is doing in your life. And he is not sitting there going, ah, another mistake, another mistake. And take the keys away to the car. <laughs> and take him off the insurance policy. Yep, nope, done. No! He's not doing that. He's saying, I'm showing you this again because I want to remind you, if you keep yourself in the stream that I'm moving in, I'm going to continue to bless you. I'm going to continue. And, we, and we have, we're so funny. We, we are so funny. We are so superstitious. You don't think so? Go have Chinese food. What happens at the end of the meal? We live our life with these little fortune cookies. <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they do. It's like, but think about it. You, 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 something happens to you a certain way, and you totally, it goes right. You try and repeat that, don't you? If I do it this way, so if I write my tithe check with my legs like this and like this, and I do it like this on the first Tuesday of the month, and oh, we have these things. And God's saying, you know, just trust me. Just trust me. You, you ever get this? My folks, if, Lord, if, if they're watching, forgive me. You ever get this? My dad would say something like this. He'd go, everything's so and so good. It's going so good. Don't say anything. Don't, don't. All the equipment's working. Everything's going good on the ranch. Don't say anything. <laughs> and, and God says, don't, don't live that way. I mean, I'm not bagging on my dad. It was, you know, it was kind of funny. We'd make a joke out of it. Because generally when things broke, they broke in threes. So the tractor breaks, this breaks, this breaks. They, they break in threes. And I said, dad, that's a kingdom dynamic. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are anointed. <laughs> you are blessed. Guy's just saying, hey, no matter what comes after you, just trust me. Just trust me. Amen? And when you got to go after something, when you're feeling the urge and you're looking for that drug, whatever it is, make it Jesus. Make it Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to be a fool for Christ. I do it every Sunday. Somebody got that. It's like, yeah, you do. Um, my kids would call that a dumb dad joke. That's a dumb dad joke. Never mind. They're like, ignore him. He'll go away. Just ignore him. He'll go into the other room. He won't say it again. That, the most uncomfortable thing, I make my kids uncomfortable, I do that, and I kiss their mom in front of them. Oh, they just, oh, dad, do you have to? Do you have to, dad? All right. Well, amen. We're going to take communion. Who wants to help with communion? Sure. Grab some. Don't spill it. Did you? That's, okay. That's all right. No, no, no pressure. Um, was, it, was that helpful? Yes. Little, little Bible study this morning. If you don't have access to a Strong's Concordance, don't worry. Your Bibles all have translation stuff in them. And, and the, the Internet's full of stuff once you have access again. In the meantime, we will continue to help. Amen. Uh, we have Bibles, too. If you don't have one and you need one, we give them away. We don't sell them. Now, we can't give you glasses to read the small print. Sorry about that. But, <laughs> but they are available. <laughs> so... Jesus was very relational, very relational. And he was having his final meal with his disciples, which he said, I don't call you disciples anymore. Disciples meaning those who learn, those who are being trained. I call you friends because you've been with me. And the Father's given you to me. And I've cared for you. And I'm going to pray he continues to care for you. And I'm going to pray for all those who are going to come to know you, come to know him because of you. And he passed around, he passed around the elements of what we call communion. Communion, coming together. I think of it sometimes this way. God knew we would, he knew what was coming and he knew we would need simple things to agree on. 
right? Because it's so hard to get people in a room to agree to one thing, everybody agree to something. So he's like, we do this. You. <laughs> Well, that's what you say, but what are you thinking? Um, so he's like, hey, we, we, if we do this communion together, y'all are going to have to sit for a few minutes and actually agree on something. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Thank you all. So we take communion here every Sunday. If you are new with us, we take communion every Sunday. And we do that in honor of Jesus Christ. We do it to give acknowledge that he's first in our lives. We do it because he said to do it. And we do it also because spiritually it continues to put us in a place to remind us who he is and what he's done. And it's not completely physical event. It is a spiritual event also. So we choose in the here and now to serve him. And through the Holy Spirit, he edifies and encourages and builds us up. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we, we take the bread and we say, in the name of Jesus, I accept you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we take the cup, which he said was the blood sacrificed for us, for our sins. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Chuck, could you do me a favor and just click stop on the streaming? You see the red, you, just, you, you see the red thing. I want to say goodbye to anybody on Facebook watching us. Thank you all for joining. I know you only join for about three minutes on average. I, I watch that stuff, but that's okay. Hopefully, it's the 